know I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my doom Till I met Sing this out. Thy mercy has saved my soul. Now your freedom is all that I know. The old made new. Jesus, when I met you, you called. our story. We're the ones that needed rescue, and he's the one that rescued us. Let's sing it out together. I needed rescue, my sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan, now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken,
the one thing that we count on as believers. I count on one thing. The same God that never fails will not fail me now. You won't fail me now in the waiting. The same God who's never late is working all things. Psalm 46 reads, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its dwelling. I don't know what you've come in with today. Some of you have come in happy and life is just going along. Some may have come in with deep burdens and hurts. But he's the God that fights our battles for us. We don't have to do it alone. Aren't you thankful for that? We don't have to do it alone. He's the God who raised up Abraham. And in the process of doing that, raised up a nation committed to him. He's the one that raised up Moses to lead the Israelites out of Egypt and provided miracle after miracle to uh, free his people from slavery. He's the one that took a young shepherd boy, David, and raised him up with courage to fight a giant that was much bigger, much stronger than he was. And he's the God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he's the one that fights our battles for us. So you don't have to do it alone. Just as we... Uh, go into this next song. It's uh, praying that it's a song of encouragement for you, especially if you're going through the battles. Just, just take a moment and listen to the words if you just want to sit and, or stand and soak them in. If you know the song and you're singing a song of triumph because He's your Lord, then sing them out. This is called Battle Belongs. And 
And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. There's nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, I'll fight on my knees, with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you, and in every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, in our worship today, we have reflected on your mercy. We've reflected on your salvation that you provide for us, Lord Jesus. And many of us here have been called, we've called, been called out of that darkness, out of that grave. And Lord, there are some that have not chosen that yet. And I ask the Lord that your Holy Spirit would bring them comfort and peace and Draw them to you, Lord Jesus. Open their eyes. Help them to see your beauty and your wisdom. And Lord Jesus, some of us here have come with troubles. And you said in John 16, Jesus, that we would have troubles in this life. But you didn't end there. You said, take heart, for I have overcome the world. In other words, the battle, God, belongs to you. Lord Jesus, we ask that you would help us to lay our burdens at, your, at the altar 
and we want to run, we want to run to you.
Good morning, everybody, and it's a blessing to be here uh, with you all this Father's Day Sunday. A little bit about me. Uh, I was born and raised in South San Francisco, so not too far from here. Uh, used to the cold, used to the fog. Uh, growing up, going to church, I'd always pass by uh, Highlands on, on the way to 280. So I'd always see the sign, Church of the Highlands. And I had friends who had gone to the Christian school, but I actually never set foot in this building until six months ago. And uh, it's been a blessing to uh, be with you guys, to get to know you. You've o- welcomed me with open arms, and uh, I've, I've really loved it here. Um, my family uh, is my father, my mother, uh, I have two younger siblings, a younger sister and a younger brother. We all live together still, as well as our spunky 10-year-old Jack Russell mix. Uh, he's probably the favorite of the family. <laughs> uh, but a little bit about how I ended up at Highlands. Some of you guys may be familiar with uh, Dr. Gary Tuck. He teaches uh, some classes here on Wednesday nights. If you've never been to any of his classes, I highly recommend it. But he was my professor uh, at Western Seminary, where I got my uh, master's degree at. And uh, he happened to refer my name to Pastor Layton. And so one day, I, out of the blue, I got an email from Pastor Layton. And it said this, uh, simply this, per recommendation from Dr. Tuck, I would like to take you out to lunch and get to know you better, Period. And for a second there, I was thinking, am I, am I being asked out on a date? <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we went out to lunch, got to know each other, and, uh, and here I am today. And so I'm, I'm excited to be here at Church of the Highlands, excited to uh, be with you all, uh, especially on this Father's Day Sunday. Uh, it, was, it was awesome, wasn't it? Seeing all the men up there singing and worshiping and leading you guys all and singing, wasn't it? Um, Earlier at the 9 a.m. service, I just, I had this, just saw this beautiful sight. Uh, one of the dads was up there singing, and, and the front row, uh, his daughter was there watching. You could see the joy and the excitement on her face to see her dad up there singing. And it was just a wonderful, a beautiful thing. Fatherhood is a beautiful, wonderful thing. Um, I want to read for you a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. He said, there are many kinds of success in life worth having. It is exceedingly interesting and attractive to be a successful businessman or railway man or farmer or a successful lawyer or doctor or writer or president or a ranchman or or the colonel of a fighting regiment or to kill grizzly bears and lions. But for unflagging interest and enjoyment, a household of children, if things go reasonably well, certainly makes all other forms of success and achievement lose their importance by comparison. Now, if you know a little bit about the life of Theodore Roosevelt, you'd understand that he did a lot of those achievements that he enlisted. He was a president. He was a colonel. He did kill grizzly bears and and lions. And despite all of those achievements that he had in his life, in this quote, he has put fatherhood, being a father, the greatest achievement of all. And so we see the power and the beauty and the importance of fatherhood, that as fathers, they model for their sons what it is to be a godly man, that as boys grow up, that they see and they're led by the example of their father as they follow God to follow in that same path. They also model for their daughters what kind of a godly man they should marry, that as they grow up into young ladies, as they look for a husband that they should look for a godly man who maybe will reflect a lot of those positive godly characteristics in their own father. And so you have both a joyful duty, but also a challenging responsibility in leading and helping to raise the next generation of followers of God. And at the same time, I want to acknowledge that not everyone here has the best relationship with their father. Some here might not even have a relationship with their earthly father. At the same time, I think the Apostle John and his passage that we're going to look through today challenges us to see that no matter what kind of father you have, both good and bad or or not around, that you have a heavenly father. You have a father who is perfect. And even though not everyone here is a father, I'm not a father, we are all sons, aren't we? We're all sons and daughters of a heavenly father. So, In his letter, the Apostle John writes how we who are Christians, who put complete faith and trust in the gospel message, are accepted and cherished as children of God, a perfect father. 
And I'm going to do something a little bit different. If, if you are able, would you please stand for the reading of God's word? Our passage for today is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29, to verse, chapter 3, verse 3. And the apostle John writes, If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. So we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Amen. You may be seated. So we see in our first point that righteousness is a trait in God's family. In verse 29, he writes, if you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. That if we know that he that is God is righteous, he is the standard for what is right and what is good, that everyone who practices righteousness, meaning anyone who does what is right, what is good, according to the standard of God, are born of him. And born of him meaning, well, we, be, we will become his children. We have to unpack this for a little bit. But a question that might come up as we read this is, does this mean then that doing good is how we become a Christian? That anyone who does good deeds will automatically become children of God? And as we look through it, we'll find that the answer is no. But what John is stressing in this verse reinforces a theme that he covers throughout this whole letter that good works, obedience, righteousness, among others, are not the means, they're not the way we become Christians, but the characteristic, the natural byproduct of having already become Christians. So it's very important to emphasize that it is not how we become a Christian that we do good, but it is the natural byproduct, the result of having become Christians that we do good, that we do righteous deeds. That being born of God or becoming children of God, that's a concept that John has discussed at length, even outside of this letter. So to look at that, we're going to have to go to his, uh, his gospel account, the book of John. In John chapter 3, verses 3 to 6, this is Nicodemus approaching Jesus. And Jesus answered him, he said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, well, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So what's described by John here is that being born of God is not something that is brought about by our own doing, by our own human will and our own human effort, uh, but, by, and, and, but by God. We notice Nicodemus' reaction here to Jesus telling him he needs to be born again, right? The absurdity of it all. How am I supposed to get back into my mother's womb and then come right back out? That's impossible, isn't it right? Isn't that right? Impossible. I, actually, I, can't even, I don't even want to picture that idea. <laughs> but what an impossible human effort that would have been to do what Nicodemus thought he needed to do. But in fact, Jesus is referring to a spiritual birth, not a physical birth, a spiritual one. One that is from the work of God to bring it about. And so how do we become spiritually born? Well, we see a few verses later in the same account, John 3, 16, the one we all know very well, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. As well as when we jump back to the very beginning of this book, chapter one, verses 12 to 13, this is his introduction to Jesus. John says, but to all who did receive him, that is Jesus Christ, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born, get this, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That's how we're born again. So how, how we can be born of God, be spiritually born, is told to us in these two verses. 
is to believe in Jesus Christ. That as God incarnate, God in the flesh, he came to this earth in order to ultimately die. That you see, none of us are perfect. We all have sin and therefore, because we all have sin, we fall short of the standard of heaven, which is what? Perfection. All the sins we've done in our lives, both big and small, they have earned us an eternity in a place called hell, a place of separation from the presence and the goodness of God. It's a place you don't want to be. But see, John 3, 16, right? God loved the world. God loved us so much that he made a way for us to be with him in heaven forever, right? And that was to have Jesus Christ the second person in the Holy Trinity to die in our place. As God, Jesus Christ was perfect and therefore the only one qualified to do this work. I couldn't do this and certainly you couldn't do this, right? Because we're all imperfect people. And as Jesus hung on that cross, he not only endured great physical pain, we all understand the pain of of being executed, being nailed to a piece of wood and, and being asphyxiated. That's great physical pain, but he endured great spiritual pain as every sin that Jordan Khan has and will ever do and every sin that you have and will ever do was placed on top of him and that judgment that we deserve for our sins was instead done to Jesus Christ. But then here's the important part, right? Jesus didn't stay dead. If he was just a regular dude and he he didn't come back to life, but he's no different from anyone else, any other religious leader who's come on this world. But three days later, we see see in the Bible that he resurrected from the dead, proving his power over death, and just as importantly, proving his ability to give us eternal life. All you have to do to receive eternal life, receive forgiveness of sins, to be born again into the family of God, is to, as these verses say, believe, believe. Put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ alone and you will be a part of God's family. The apostle Paul writes in Romans 10, nine to 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you might be saved? No, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. There is this action that you believe in your heart that this gospel message is true and you express with your mouth that you believe. And that's all it takes. Sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? And yet here's what it says. This is how you're born again. And so knowing this, as we go back to verse 29, we now know that we aren't dealing with how we become a child of God when we practice good, but what it looks like to be a child of God. If God is righteous, then we should also be righteous because that is the family characteristic that we share with our father. We have to understand that John was addressing in this letter the aftermath and confusion stemming from an infiltration of false teachers into the church. That these people claim to be followers of God, Christians, brothers, that they love Jesus. But at the same time, they were teaching deceitful lies intentionally deceitful eyes about who Jesus Christ was. All of this in order to lead Christians astray. And so the question that came up was, how could we tell true brothers brothers and sisters in Christ from false brothers and sisters? How do we even know ourselves that we're true believers, true Christians? By examining the characteristics. Do we have the family traits that are found in those who are members of God's family? Are we living out righteousness just as our heavenly father is righteous? Now, when I was a junior in high school, I went on a missions trip to China. And it was one of those collaborative efforts. There was a big organization. There were different churches that were sending teams out from various countries to join together and to minister to teenagers out in China. And so you have people represented from countries like Australia, America, Canada, Malaysia, all together. And so to get there, we took a flight uh, in from, to Hong Kong, and then from Hong Kong, then flew t- into China, and then, a- then everyone would then board buses to then drive out into the mountains where we'd be ministering. 
And so on the bus, I got to meet other young people who were serving on this trip and getting to know them, including one girl in particular. And as we were talking, she abruptly says, I just noticed your nose is pretty big. <laughs> uh, right? Well, who says that, doesn't it, right? And I, was, I was so caught off guard, and as any self-conscious, uh, insecure teenager would react, I was stuttering, stammering, mm, uh, but all I could get out in embarrassment was, it's a family trait. It's a family trait. You see, my siblings and I, as well as some of my cousins, we have what's called the con nose. It's a feature that I inherited from my father, who inherited it from his father, and who knows, maybe from his father too, but because I have been born from my father, I inherit and share some of his genetic traits and his features, including the nose. Right? It's a marker, a characteristic of being the son of Kevin, my father. And don't we all marvel at the resemblance children share with their parents? I know all you parents out there, think about, look, look at your kids and you, you, you marvel at how you see little pieces of yourself show up in them, sometimes more than others, uh, whether it is by how they look, their eyes, their nose size, their hair type, their hair color, or how tall or short they are, or even their personalities, right? When they behave, you go, oh, yep, they got that from me. <laughs> so, but in the same way, we strive to live our lives the way God has laid out for us in his holy word, the correct way, the righteous way. Like, for example, when we daily develop in our lives the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That as we do this, as we, we resemble more and more the characteristics of our heavenly father, right? Right? We start to look like our Heavenly Father, not in physical looks, but in our actions, in our attitudes, in our characteristics, in our behavior. And so John leads off this part of the letter revealing that if we are indeed born of God, that we will share characteristics of him. And of course, the implication, of course, if we share characteristics of him, uh, that we are his children. Chapter three, verse one says, see what kind of love the father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. John is pointing out here, look at how great the father's love for us is. It is demonstrated for us in, in the fact that we are called his children, that we are his children. That's how much he loves you and loves me. That because God loves us and has welcomed us into his family as his children, we can be joyful. You know, it's well known, especially among Asians, the struggle around the cultural differences between those who immigrated from Asia and their children who were born and raised here in the American culture. Like, over here, saying the words, I love you are an extremely important uh, thing. It's significant. And we look for that. We listen for that. We long for that. Someone to say, I love you. Maybe to our own detriment, right? Because there's plenty of people out in this world who will be willing to say those words, but actually in action, do the opposite, don't they? But with the immigrant generation, their understanding of the expression of love is different. Words of love don't mean as much as the action of love. For them, expressing their love for their children came from providing for their needs, feeding them, sacrificing of themselves so that their children could go further in life than they ever could. For them, that was how they showed love. And that's why it's common to hear the stories from people who grew up in America, starting off with, Oh, my father never said the words, I love you. But church, God doesn't just say he loves us or cares about us as some performative action, but is demonstrated to us by the mere fact that he has thrown open his arms and he says, I love you. Come be my son. Come be my daughter. 
See how much I love you, that the, through the beauty of the gospel message, you are not defined as my creation, though that is, just, that is true, we are created by God, that you are not just defined as my servant, though we do serve God, but you are my precious and beloved children. Have you internalized that in your own heart? Do you, have you realized that, that you are precious and beloved children of God? That he's a father who loves you, cares about you? And it's likely that not all of you have a good relationship with your father. Not all of you even have a relationship with your father. But as a Christian, as a believer, you have a father. A heavenly father who is perfect, who loves you, who cares about you, who leads you, provides for you, corrects you. And he will never leave you. He will always be with you. That is the father that you have, regardless of whether you have an earthly father who does that. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, one in four children are being raised without a biological uh, adoptive or stepfather in the home. Think about that. Wow. One in four. Now, if you come to uh, any of the children's ministries or, or even better yet, if you've come during the school year to uh, the, the Christian Academy over here and you see all the children running around and, and learning and playing, could you imagine layering that statistic onto them? And you look at that, that every fourth child that you see doesn't have any kind of father figure in their life, that's devastating, it's sobering. Then the world cheers this on. The world encourages this. It even takes political and societal action to actively push men and fathers out of the picture of their children's lives. You see, God created the nuclear family as the ideal situation for raising children in order to be healthy, physically, emotionally, but also spiritually. Fathers are to, as God is their example, love, teach, lead, discipline, care for their children. And of course, I recognize that there are, of course, always exceptions and circumstances relating to a single parenthood. And as God shows grace and he works in those situations for good, so should we also show grace. But we must not let this give us license to follow the lead of the world and to say fathers aren't important. We can't. That's a lie. Because we need godly fathers present in the lives of their children. Because that's how God had designed it. So thank you, fathers, who have answered the call and have faithfully given of your life to your children, just as your heavenly father has that you model for them the love, the care, the strength of God. And yet at the same time, not everyone has so embraced the fatherly love of God that God has opened the opportunity to join their family. And they say no. At the end of verse one, he says, the reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. We're talking in a relational sense. The unbelieving world has rejected God's offer of a fatherly relationship. His arms are open, waiting to accept them, but they refuse to come. They are not his children, and they don't have this intimate, familial relationship that we have with him. That's why the world is so mean to us. That's why they attack us. They have no care for God, and therefore they have no care for us who are his children. It's hard not to be liked, isn't it? It's hard to be attacked by others. It's not fun. But when we're rooted in that relationship that we know we have with our Heavenly Father, and when we have the confidence that He loves us, protects us, provides for us, we can endure the rejection of those on the outside of God's family. We have security in the arms of God. We can even love those people, can't we? We should love those people. And so God declares through John that he has welcomed us into his family as beloved children, cherished, loved, treasured. And for that reason, to be a child of God is to have 
hope. Verse two, beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Let's take the first line here. Beloved, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet appeared. You see, the emphasis here is that we are children of God, but it isn't only in a, in a sense that something will occur in the future. We won't be God's children just in heaven, but it's a reality that we experience right now. At the moment of your salvation, when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, you are at this very moment declared a child of God. That we have a relationship on this earth, in this life right now. And so because of that, what is the implication? Don't wait. Don't wait to experience and live out that relationship with God that you have with him. That this life was intended for us to live for him right now, to enjoy the blessing, to enjoy the direction, enjoy the purpose that God gives us in this life right now. We also see there's, there's a finality, a certain finality to this statement in which we are God's children now. And if we are God's children now, we will be his children for all eternity. You thought about that as well, that we are God's children now and forever that that won't be lost. You see, to be abandoned is a traumatic experience. And for children to be abandoned by a parent has such a lasting and enduring pain that creates emotional, but also spiritual scars. I've seen that personally, but this isn't our God. He declares to those who love him and follow him, get this, he says these in his very words, I will never leave you, I will not forsake you. Have you internalized this truth in your heart too, that even in the midst of difficult times, even when it feels like that God isn't near or that he has abandoned you, that in his word, he says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Hallelujah. Amen. What a blessing that we have the security that God won't ever abandon us. And as believers, we can live securely in the love of our father. We are God's children now at this very moment. But then John also writes that also who we are, it isn't done yet. In the second half, he says, what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. Now being a child of God right now on this earth, that's pretty great. We should be joyful. We should savor that. We should love that. But it is only a small taste of what it is to come in eternity when Jesus Christ comes back. We live in a time that is called the now and not yet kingdom. The now and not yet kingdom. That Jesus Christ has indeed come. This is the now part. That he has won. He has freed us from the chains of sin and death. And he's given us salvation. But all you have to do is turn on the news or look around and see the rampant sin that is around us, or even the battle against sin that is within us, and know that not everything has been fixed yet. It's not fixed yet, hasn't it? But he will. He promises this, that as Christians freed from the grip of sin, that we can live as a light to this world, as children of the Father, right now, at this very moment. But we must, we must remember that something even better awaits us when he, and that is Jesus Christ, appears. Why is that? Well, in his, in his glorious, uh, we, are, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We are imperfect still. Yes, even as believers, right? We still wrestle with sin and at times we lose. Isn't that frustrating? Isn't that make you want to pull your hair out? But when Jesus Christ makes his glorious return, John says, we will be like him. How are we supposed to be like him? In his glorious perfection. Perfect. Being finally free of and rid of the sin that has been so a part of us since our very birth. We will be perfect, lacking in nothing. We will have glorified, perfect bodies, just like Jesus Christ whom we were able to see with our very eyes. And we will look into the face of the man who made his life a sacrifice for us so that 
we could be made a part of God's family. Can you imagine that? Have you ever thought about the, 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 what we're going to happen down the line that when Jesus comes back, that we're going to look with our very eyes on the face of the man that we read in the Bible, that we worship here today, that we sing songs to? We're going to see him, touch him, talk to him face to face. I can't, I can't even imagine what it's going to be like. But that's what we look forward to. And when we realize that we are beloved children of the perfect father right now, that we have the hope of being like him in perfection and goodness, what should our response be? How should we respond? Well, in verse three, and everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Simply put, be like your father. In some ways, we've circled back around again to the beginning of this passage, right? In verse 29, when we talked about how children bear characteristics and traits of their parents, and of course, for our purposes, specifically the father, right? And so John's challenge to the church of his day, which is the same challenge for us as the church today, is to demonstrate, live out those family characteristics, we just saw in verse two that when we see Jesus Christ returning in all of his glory and perfection, we will be made like him and his perfection and his sinlessness. But that doesn't excuse us from trying to live like him right now. That we didn't just get this get out of hell free card and we can coast for the rest of our life, but we are called to try to pursue, to live like him right now in this earthly life, to live out those family characteristics. The word purify in the Greek has an idea of cleansing from defilement. We want to be clean from the inside out, just like our father is clean. Our desire and our calling as children of God is to refuse to act on, indulge in, and be captured by sin. To remember that this was the old life, and now we are born into a new life, a better life, a holy life that is set apart from the old desires. And as parents, you, uh, you would hope to model for your children an example of proper attitude and, and godly morality for them to follow. But you have an even greater example for yourself to follow, which is the example of God right? as your heavenly father. So as you follow your heavenly father who models what it is to live a godly life to you, that you are doing the same for your children as well. And again, we won't, be, we won't be perfect. There is no such thing as a perfect parent here. But until that glorious day Jesus Christ comes, it is still the calling for each and every one of us who are children of God to be ready for Jesus Christ to come at any moment. John even explained just a few verses earlier in verse 28 of chapter 2 that when he comes, we should be morally fit to stand with confidence. That's the idea of standing straight, standing with confidence before him and not shrinking away from him in shame. That's the idea of trying to hide. You have done something, you're trying to hide your shame. So we should have confidence that we are living a life that is pleasing to him in every single moment so that if he comes suddenly just like that, we can stand before him without any kind of load on our shoulders that weighs us down. Right? The baggage of our sins that we're still indulging in, holding on to, refusing to let go. How embarrassing would it be if Jesus Christ were to come back and catch you in the middle of a sin? That as you were in this sin, Jesus Christ suddenly appears, you go, oh, Jesus, I wasn't expecting you to come back so soon. I thought yeah, I had at least 10 more years. And imagine what would his response be? I don't think any of us wants to be in that situation. No, we want to live a pure and different life. One that is modeled for us by Jesus Christ's perfect life on this earth. One that the outside world can't help but see is different. That should be our response to the hope of being children of God. This is how we should live our lives as part of his family. And as we conclude, I just want to share a quote from the pastor and evangelist, Billy Graham. He says, the greatest tribute a boy can give to his father is to say, 
When I grow up, I want to be just like my dad. It is a convicting responsibility for us fathers and grandfathers. What a responsibility and joy it is. And I'm thankful for my earthly father and for the father figures in my life and how they've always pointed me to my heavenly father. That as my dad raised me, as he sought to follow Jesus Christ and to live like him, that he had inputted that into my life. That I had seen that modeled in my life from a little kid till now. And I know most fathers don't like this day to be a big fuss and prefer to just lay low and relax, maybe enjoy some steak or something. But as we designate certain days for specific remembrance and for celebration, we, we appreciate all the fathers out there who reflect the love, the care, and protection of our Heavenly Father. So today, take the time to thank your father or a father figure in your life for the impact that they've had on you. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, I thank you for the, that we can even call you our Heavenly Father. That we didn't deserve to be made your children. We rebelled. We, we've turned our backs on you. We've, we've spit in your face. And yet, out of your great love for us, you made a way for us to be welcomed into your family. Not as your creation, not as just your servants, but as beloved and cherished children. Your arms are open wide and you call us to you, that you care for us, that you love us. I pray for anybody who's here and they haven't, haven't made that decision, Lord, that your arms are open right now saying, come to me, be my child. I love you. That they will make this decision even today, that they will believe in their heart, that they will confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, that you raise him from the dead to give us eternal life. It's all it takes. And I pray for all who are here, who are beloved children of God, who desire to live out this life, this new life, being born of you, that you will continue to push us, that you continue to guide us, that you continue to lead us, but also that we'll continue to hold in our hearts, remember that you love us, that you will never leave or forsake us. And that as we look forward to spending eternity with you, that we will be faithful in this life. So it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Great message. I've been enjoying listening to Jordan at the 5 p.m. service and encourage you to keep track of the bulletin of when he is going to be delivering a message. I myself, listening to his message, was, was challenged with the idea of uh, seeing where I can fulfill that role as father. How many kids are in my classes that don't have dads? Uh, how about my own stepsons? Have I really stepped into the role that I could assume with them? And then also my, my children and all the grandchildren that are there. I'm challenged to be the best dad. And I know I'm going to have to lean into Jesus in order to see that and do that. Um, so we're celebrating Father's Day. It's a great day. Um, the role of father, of course, originated with our perfect heavenly father. Um, and in the Old Testament, uh, he's often referred to with the phrase, the God of our fathers. And there's many names for God in the Old Testament. They all are uh, pointing towards his power, his being the most high God, his being a holy God. In the New Testament, it's Jesus, God in the flesh, that instructs us and makes possible intimacy and personal relationship with God. Um, when asked by the disciples, teach us to pray, Jesus started by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's from Jesus that comes our awareness of God as a heavenly father. He said, Abba, Daddy, that there's a possibility of intimate personal relationship uh, with this most high God. He's our father and we're his family. Uh, as we heard already, 1 John 3, 1, see what kind of love the father has given to us that we should be called the children of God. And so we are. When the disciple Philip asked Jesus, show us the father, Jesus replied, the one who's seen me has seen the father. 
Every word or deed of Jesus began with God the Father, be it eloquent truth, compassionate healing, or victory over evil. It all revealed the wisdom, the grace, the power of God the Father. Jesus came not only to reveal God the Father, but also to reconcile us to him. And today, once again, we remember how Jesus did that. Jesus took our place. Uh, he gave his body and blood on the cross to pay for our sins. And in doing so, he opened the way for our relationship with God to be restored. So if uh, you'll hold the elements to uh, John 3.16, we heard that verse as well. So God so loved the world that he gave his only son. What a, what a sacrifice on the part of God the Father, knowing what would happen to Jesus. That whoever believes in him, that's an invitation to all, should not perish but have everlasting life. In 1 Corinthians 11, we're told, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let, us, let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So let's take a moment to do that, to examine ourselves secure in the promise of 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So feel, just take a moment, get with God, and, and uh, he's so willing to forgive. He did not come to condemn. Well, he's not done with us yet. He's not done. And we can go to him anytime yeah, during the day or night and get with him. He wants us to do that. Uh, he loves us when his children come to him. But let's uh, now take the bread and the cup and remember Jesus' words uh, at that table at the Last Supper, um, just hours away from this, his sacrifice on the cross for us. Um, in 1 Corinthians 11, again, for I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember what Jesus did for us and drink the cup. So we proclaim the Lord's death on our behalf and our forgiveness that he won for us, our relationship with the Father. We proclaim his resurrection. Jesus, unlike any other, rose from the dead, conquered death, and offers us eternal life. And we proclaim his return until he comes, it says. Would you say that with me? Until he comes. Let's try that again. Until he comes. Please pray with me. Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for adopting us as your children. We live in your love. We need you so much. I thank you for your provision for us in Jesus. We pray it in his beautiful, holy, and powerful name. Amen. For the benediction today is from uh, Ephesians 1.3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Go in peace. <laughs>